Life in this society being, at best, an utter bore, and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women, there remains to civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females only to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation, and destroy the male sex. Hello? Hi. I'm just shocked. I I don't want to be destroyed. Do we get a vote? I'd rather not be destroyed, please. I don't think you have a choice in it, (laughs) Amr. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. I am Erin. And I am Amr. And this is Das Criminal Podcast. Your favorite podcast. Uh, Recommend us to all of your friends. Or if you hate us, recommend us to all of your enemies. You know, you can inflict our voice on people you despise. This episode, guys, buckle up for this one. I am probably going to manage to piss off all kinds of feminists and anti-feminists alike. So if you like angry listening, this one is for you. The real horseshoe theory with Erin at the smack in the middle. Keep an open mind. You need an open mind for this, trust me. So open that your brain falls out? Yeah, and like turns into a puddle in front of you. We do want to give a serious warning here at the beginning. This episode will include discussions of child sex abuse and incest. So if that is really upsetting to you, this probably isn't the best episode for you. Some of the subject matter as well, like Valerie Solanus's writing, is, I would say, particularly vulgar, even for us. So we would not recommend listening with your kids in the car. We don't believe in shock jock podcasting, but we also don't believe in sugarcoating. So we are going to read to you what's on the pages. And without further ado, here we go. In 1967, little-known writer Valerie Solanus self-published her anti-patriarchy pamphlet, The Scum Manifesto. To some, the manifesto is a revolutionary work. To others, a misandrist screed. Whether it's intended as pointed satire, or as Solanus herself once claimed, dead serious. The text has regardless become a staple of a particular strain of radical feminism. But Valerie Solanus wasn't only a woman of biting words. She was a woman of action. On Monday, June 3, 1968, Solanus made her way to 33 Union Square West in New York City. In a brown paper bag, she concealed a 32 caliber Beretta automatic and a 22 Colt revolver. The building housed Andy Warhol's famed avant-garde space, The Factory, and Solanus was after the pop artist himself. After she waited a couple of hours, Andy Warhol arrived. Solanus, an acquaintance of Warhol, joined him and his boyfriend, Jed Johnson, in the lift. The elevator doors opened at the sixth floor, where Warhol's friends and business associates waited for him. Andy Warhol took a phone call. Then, at approximately 4.20 p.m., blaze it, Valerie Solanus pulled out her Beretta and started shooting. Andy Warhol reportedly yelled, No, no, Valerie, don't do it. Three bullets towards Warhol, one ripping through his torso. Two shots at art critic Mario Amaya, one hitting his hip. A final attempt to execute Warhol's manager, Fred Hughes. The gun jammed. Solanus perhaps believing she had completed her mission of killing Andy Warhol, fled. The extent to which Valerie Solanus's anti-man philosophies propelled her decision to gun down Andy Warhol is a matter of debate. Other components, like Solanus's relationship to Warhol as a potential producer of her risque play and her increasing paranoia as a result of untreated schizophrenia, certainly factor in as well. So in this episode, we're going to discuss Valerie Solanus's life, her works, and what some people might consider her most memorable performance, the attempted assassination of pop art luminary Andy Warhol. And we'll try our best to situate these circumstances within a broader analysis of radical feminism to try and answer the question, is there anything redeeming in Valerie Solanus's prose? Or is it all just scum? So let's begin with an overview of the early life of our tale's anti-heroine, Valerie Jean Solanus. I thought it could be Solanus, but then I thought she probably wouldn't want anus in her last name. So we're going to say Solanus. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Born in April of 1936 into the tumultuous marriage of Louis Lou Solanus and Dorothy Biondo, young Valerie was witty, daring, and precocious. 
As feminist psychologist and biographer Brian Foss points out, accounts of Valerie's childhood vary. Some people claim Valerie was happy and charming, while others characterize her as sharp and defiant. However Valerie may have behaved during these years, a few facts are clear. Valerie's parents separated when she was just four years old, sending her and her younger sister Judith to live with their maternal grandparents for some time near Atlantic City, New Jersey. Dorothy, Valerie's mother, remarried a piano tuner named Red Moran, who was never very kind to Valerie. Valerie struggled with poverty, familial instability, and likely sprouting mental illness during her adolescent years. And Valerie most definitely suffered physical and very likely sexual abuse, probably at the hands of her own father and possibly her stepfather and grandfather as well. Here, I'd like to refer to Valerie's scum manifesto when when she describes fatherhood. Quote, Mother wants what's best for her kids. Daddy only wants what's best for daddy. That is peace and quiet, pandering to his delusion of dignity. Brackets, respect. A good reflection on himself, quote, status. And the opportunity to control and manipulate, or if he's an enlightened father, to give guidance. His daughter, in addition, he wants sexually. He gives her hand in marriage, hand being bolded. The other part is for him. Daddy, unlike mother, can never give in to his kids, as he must at all costs preserve his delusion of decisiveness, forcefulness, always rightness, and strength. Never getting one's way leads to lack of self-confidence in one's ability to cope with the world and to passive acceptance of the status quo. Mother loves her kids, although she sometimes gets angry. But anger blows over quickly, and even while it exists, doesn't preclude love and basic acceptance. Emotionally diseased daddy doesn't love his kids. He approves of them, if they're good, that is. If they're nice, respectful, obedient, subservient to his will, quiet, and not given to unseemly displays of temper that would be most upsetting to daddy's easily disturbed male nervous system. In other words, if they're passive vegetables. If they're not good, he doesn't get angry, not if he's a modern, civilized father. In brackets, the old-fashioned, ranting, raving brute is preferable as he is so ridiculous he can be easily despised, end of brackets, but rather express disapproval, a state that, unlike anger, endures and precludes a basic acceptance, leaving the kid with a feeling of worthlessness and a lifelong obsession with being approved of. The result is fear of independent thought as this leads to unconventional disapproved of opinions and a way of life, end quote. So clearly there's a lot going on here regarding Valerie's opinions on fatherhood, but given her abuse by various father figures in her life, I do sympathize with where she's coming from on that assessment, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's accurate to point out that for Valerie Solanas and for a lot of girls, unfortunately, Their father is actually the first abuser in their lives, and that's really fucked up, and it damages their relationship to boys and men and to themselves for the rest of their lives. Yeah, definitely. Like, kids are very, very, very malleable. They're very, like, they're blank checks, basically. They're tabula rasa. To be abused by the person who's supposed to protect you, this person who's supposed to love you, is... It changes things in a very fundamental way for a kid's psychology. The effects are completely permanent, so to speak. Right. And finally, we as a society are getting a little bit better, not great, of course, but a little bit better at finding ways to cope with that and help people move on. And of course, tons and tons of people who have shitty childhoods grow up to be, you know, amazing and competent and loving parents. And like, we shouldn't look at anyone as damaged or broken or anything like that. That's a fucked up thing to do. But I think, as we'll see in Valerie's life, this really did affect her. And it really took over her psyche in a way that is just so sad. Yeah, yeah, I definitely sympathize. And I understand where her thoughts come from in that sense. Also, as a man, I do find myself agreeing with Valerie's assessment of male emotion in many ways. For example, she says, quote, Disapproval of emotional scenes leads to fear of strong emotion, fear of one's own anger and hatred. Fear of anger and hatred combined with a lack of self-confidence in one's ability to cope with and change the world 
or even to affect in the slightest way one's own destiny, lead to a mindless belief that the world and most people in it are nice and the most banal, trivial amusements are great fun and deeply pleasurable. The effect of fatherhood on males, specifically, is to make them men, that is highly defensive of all impulsives to passivity, and then here she uses a slur, um, which I'm not going to repeat, but it's the F word for men, and of desires to be female. Every boy wants to imitate his mother, be her, fuse with her, but daddy forbids this. He is the mother. He gets to fuse with her. So he tells the boy, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, to not be a sissy, to act like a man. The boy, scared shitless of and respecting his father, complies and becomes just like daddy, that model of manhood, the all-American ideal, the well-behaved heterosexual dullard, end quote. Yeah, first of all, I tell a chuckle when she says dullard, but also I do sympathize with in the sense that I understand the fear of emotional scenes and thus the consequent fear of strong emotion, like I've been there, done that. So whether the Scum Manifesto was intended as satire or dead serious truth, I do think, Valerie, you did reach some very insightful conclusions, despite the rather sardonic rhetoric. Yeah, I would agree. And we'll get more into the Scum Manifesto later in this episode. But she does make some points there about how patriarchy, or as it's called sometimes now, toxic masculinity, is damaging to boys as well. Yeah, I think she does well in pointing out how men are socialized or conditioned into this sort of cult of masculinity. Yeah, definitely. In 1951, when she was only 14 years old, Valerie became pregnant and gave birth to a daughter, Linda Moran. During her pregnancy, Valerie was sent away to a boarding school for wayward teen girls a facility that likely bore similarities to the Magdalene Laundries in Ireland in that it was intended to sequester women and girls who had done something considered sexually shameful. Linda was raised by Valerie's mother and stepfather as Valerie's sister. It wasn't until much later in her life that she learned Valerie was actually her biological mother. The identity of Linda's father is also unknown. While it's feasible that Valerie was sexually involved with someone else, it's also possible that the pregnancy was a result of sexual abuse by Valerie's father, Lou, or her stepfather, Red. In any case, pregnancy and childbirth at only 14 years old was in all likelihood traumatic for Valerie, and these experiences, and the possible abuse surrounding them, contributed to Valerie's understanding of sexism and the heavy injustices that had been dealt to her on account of being born female. And unfortunately for Valerie, her woes weren't over. In 1952, she struck up a relationship with a sailor who had recently returned from the Korean War. This dirtbag was married with three children while Valerie was only 15 years old. Soon, Valerie became pregnant once again, and the soldier left her high and dry. Remember, this was 20 years before Roe v. Wade, and abortion wasn't safe or accessible in many parts of the United States. Additionally, the stigma of childbirth out of wedlock meant that women and girls who became unexpectedly or unwillingly pregnant were left with very few options. Whether Valerie would have sought to terminate either of these pregnancies is unclear. Her parents again decided to hide the second pregnancy from the wider community and pushed Valerie to allow a middle-class couple the Blackwells, to adopt her son in exchange for paying her college tuition. Despite these significant setbacks, Valerie succeeded in graduating high school and enrolling in the University of Maryland, College Park. Her hard start at life didn't seem to dampen her clever wit, but it did shape her worldview, which would ultimately manifest in the creation of Scum and the shooting of Valerie's one-time acquaintance, Andy Warhol. At the University of Maryland, Valerie majored in psychology. Her supervisor remembers her having a chip on her shoulder miles high. Valerie rebelled against social standards at the time, rejecting traditional femininity and instead marching to the beat of her own drum. Valerie gained somewhat of a reputation for taking advantage of others' generosity and outstaying her welcome. She expected favors from others, but when they eventually balked at giving her more money or space while she didn't repay them, Valerie took it as a personal slight. 
She was known to be particularly vengeful, at one point allegedly pissing in another girl's orange juice carton and putting it back in the fridge. That, oh, gross. That's mean, but it's funny. (laughs) It's funny, but, like, I don't think drinking piss in general is, like, dangerous. Like, it's not poisonous or anything. It's disgusting. I mean, it's disgusting, but she she wasn't going to kill her or anything. Yeah. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm not saying go around pissing in your friend various beverages. But still, like, I don't know. It's, it's funny, but it's just weird. It's just, oh, man. Well, anyways, these issues would later resurface in her interactions with Warhol. Also, not to belabor the point, but I feel like logistically peeing in an orange juice carton seems like a very difficult task for someone like Valerie. Funnel. Oh. Oh, okay. Huh. At least she's practical. Okay. I'm just guessing here. I'm, I don't know that for sure. Yeah, men are blessed. So maybe that Valerie maybe that's say why, otherwise. Maybe, yeah, I was gonna say maybe that's why she wrote this comic manifesto. She was jealous we can pee wherever we want. At university, Valerie honed her writing skills and began crafting a distinctly caustic voice. She used her school's newspaper to rail against the campus's misogynists, countering their open claims that women belonged in the kitchen rather than the classroom. And even many of those highly critical of Solanus's writing in the Scum Manifesto would probably agree that at this time, she was putting up a good fight to advance the status of women in higher education. Solanus's sexuality and her relationship with men remained somewhat ambivalent. At the University of Maryland, she was an out and proud lesbian, a rarity at that time and a cause for social ostracism. But she also had sexual and romantic entanglements with men at different periods of her life. It's also likely, after withdrawing from a master's program at the University of Minnesota, that Solanus engaged in sex work, though like many aspects of her life, this has never been confirmed. In truth, human sexuality is complicated and often dynamic. Whether Valerie Solanus felt attracted to men or women or both or neither at any given time is perhaps a question we'll never be able to answer. In the early 1960s, Solanus moved to New York City to be among like-minded renegades. Supporting herself through waitressing and possibly panhandling in sex work, she focused again on her writing, this time drafting what many consider a semi-autobiographical short play, Up Your Ass. I paid six U.S. dollars for a digital copy of Up Your Ass, as the play itself is actually central to Solanus's later virulence toward Andy Warhol. Don't worry, we're going to get to all that. But for now, I just want to spend a moment looking at this profoundly obscene text. Like many pieces of literature, Up Your Ass begins with an inscription. I dedicate this play to me, a continuous source of strength and guidance, and without whose unflinching loyalty, devotion, and faith, this play would never have been written. Additional acknowledgments, myself, for proofreading, editorial comment, helpful hints, criticisms, and suggestions, and an exquisite job of typing. I, for independent research into men, married women, and other degenerates. How do you not find that funny? That's funny. It's fucking great, man. It's gold. I have to respect her confidence, like like massive respect for that. Up Your Ass is certainly not a play for the Victorian moralists among us. Through the character of the hustler, I believe it's pronounced Bongai, perhaps Bongi, who I believe is almost certainly a theatrical representation of Solanus herself, Solanus satires her disgust with men, with lines including, but not limited to, all your passions concentrated in your dick. Get your AP hand off my boob, or I'll kick you in your big, fat, hairy shins. No, it doesn't have a name. It's just an everyday, run-of-the-mill, anonymous turd. And of course, the clincher. Men are totally unreasonable. They can't see why they should be eliminated. I actually have a theory that Valerie was killed by a covert government program because if she lived long enough to make a Twitter account, she'd be way too powerful and unleash the end of days because that just genuinely reads like one of those Twitter accounts that's like, men are trash, men fuck men, and that's about it. I think it's funny, though. I honestly think she's better than most Twitter accounts. (laughs) 
Well, yeah, I mean, like, if she was on Twitter, she'd be a lot more refreshing and unique than your average, like, men are trash, like, times 100 repeats. At least at least her insults are creative. I'll give her that. Oh, she's really, she's a good writer, yeah. I think. We'll get to that a little bit more. But this is really where we first begin to see, perhaps ironically, perhaps not, Valerie Solanus begin suggesting androcide or the eradication of men. And this theme would be paramount to her 1967 scum manifesto. Throughout her life and works, Solana shifts back and forth on whether she's Jonathan Swifting us or literally advocating for the elimination of all men. So let's jump right into Valerie Solanus's seminal work, The Scum Manifesto. Both heralded and hated, it's Solanus's outline for what she sees as a man-free, post-currency, transhumanist society. Some sources cite SCUM as an acronym for the Society for Cutting Up Men, though Solanus denied this. SCUM to her was a dirty four-letter word that she was reclaiming, an insult frequently launched at her and women like her who were pushed to the margins of society and chastised for fighting to survive. Read as satire, the SCUM manifesto is honestly hilarious. It's what I would summarize as a 50-page scream both in the sense of hooting comedy and riled outcry. In the second paragraph, she labels the male, quote, an incomplete female, a walking abortion, end quote. And this is part of why, if read as a sardonic statement, the Scum Manifesto is actually an effective little piece of propaganda. It subverts the texts of lauded men like Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Sigmund Freud, which suggest women are deficient or deformed men. Throughout her piece, Solanus does this several more times. She asserts that it's men, not women, who are driven by visceral desires rather than rationality. Men are inherently weak and cowardly. Men have pussy envy. Men are dependent on marriage and the proliferation of the nuclear family. Men are destined to be submissive. In a comparison between the life and works of Valerie Solanus and other male authors who have committed acts of violence against women, Norman Mailer, William Burroughs, Pablo Neruda, writer Chavisa Woods notes, quote, Valerie Solanus just said in a modernized, now dated vernacular, exactly what Freud had said about women, only about men, and everyone freaked out, because when we talk about men the same way men have talked about women for centuries, it reads as grotesque and insanely violent and compassionate and shocking, which was exactly her point. Her work is still misinterpreted as a literal text by many to this day. End quote. I'm not sure I agree that there's a correct interpretation of Solanus's work, just as, you know, I'm not sure there's a correct interpretation of a lot of pieces of art or literature. Once you put it out there, you know, it's up to the audience to make sense of it. But personally, I read a lot of the text as hyperbole. For example, at one point in the manifesto, Solanus writes, A few examples of the most obnoxious or harmful types of men are, one, rapists, okay, two, politicians and all who are in their service, okay, I I can get that as well, three, Lousy singers, composers, and musicians. I mean, okay, look, to be fair, anyone who's listened to, like, one James Blunt song will be like, yep, this is Ted Bundy. Well, she continues the list from there, but, like, that to me is obviously comical satire. I don't know how you could take it any other way. She's mixing in men who commit violence against women or engage in institutional discrimination in the case of the politicians with men who annoy her. And the debate about what constitutes good satire, you know, of course, it's still raging. But Valerie Solanus did shoot Andy Warhol and Mario Amaya. And when asked why she did it, she told the press, quote, I have a lot of reasons. Read my manifesto and it will tell you what I am, end quote. And she also claimed that the work wasn't parody, but was dead serious. So it's Solanus herself and not necessarily the reader who has linked the scum manifesto to the shooting. She took her own words past the point of irony when she fired that Beretta at Warhol and claimed it was part of this movement. I don't think we can really blame people for connecting the scum manifesto to her assassination attempt of Andy Warhol because she said that. 
Yeah, I know, but I mean, it could also be like genuine commitment to the bit. I don't know. It's very hard, very, very hard to understand what she was thinking. Yeah, the writer you just quoted as well, Shavisa Woods, said in her piece, she's like, she shot Andy Warhol, but she didn't kill him. And it's like, yeah, but not for lack of trying. <laughs> like, I don't. Yeah, it's not like she was out there just to maim or injure. She was aiming to kill. Right. I don't. I don't think that's the best defense I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> But in another way, Solanus' targeting of Warhol, it doesn't align with her ideas in the Scum Manifesto. She writes that Scum will spare the members of the men's auxiliary unit, which includes, among others, gay men who, quote, by their shimmering, flaming example, encourage other men to demand themselves and thereby make themselves completely inoffensive, end quote. And Solanus As Amr said before, she actually uses a slur in her writing to describe gay men, but we're not going to repeat it here. Andy Warhol was openly gay, and his sexuality influenced his artistry. He produced erotica focusing on gay men, and he often subverted the heteronormative composition of so-called high art. So I think on Solanus' own scale of patriarchy crimes, he would be considered one of the least bad men. And here's a fun fact. Warhol actually photographed Stonewall igniter Marsha P. Johnson for a series in 1975. If she was shooting men because she was anti-men, there are a lot more men at that time period out there that were more deserving of it than Andy Warhol. Like, she could have fucking shot Kissinger for fuck's sake. Yeah, we're going to get in more to her personal relationship with Warhol. And I feel bad for him regardless. Like, nobody deserves to be shot, of course. Well, I might take that back, but (laughs) poor Andy Warhol truly didn't deserve this. Yeah. So the question as to whether Valerie Solanus was a prescient philosopher or a raving lunatic when she wrote the Scum Manifesto is, in my opinion, a misleading one. Raving lunatics make good points sometimes. I think Solanus was wrong to shoot those people, and I don't think that violent act can be just erased from her biography. But I can see why the Scum Manifesto has become a metamorphic text for some feminists. It's compelling in that it exposes the patriarchy at its weak points. Men can dish it out, but they can't take it. And some men are very afraid by the thought of women subjugating men as men have subjugated women for centuries. And just look up, take a moment and Google Scum Manifesto or Valerie Solanus and look at the things men's rights activists or whatever they call themselves, what sexists are saying about it. And they're taking it very literally and saying like, this is what women want to do. They want to castrate all men. And I think what's actually so amusing about the Scum Manifesto and the responses to it is that it gives you a chance to basically tell men to like, calm down stop taking it so seriously. Take a joke. All these things that men tell women all of the time. Yeah, I think in that that sense, it is a masterpiece in subverting the sort of traditional expectations, traditional stereotypes. It's really, it's really, it goes well beyond what's in the text itself in its effect on both men and women and the general sort of relations of power. Right, because when Solana says, pick any number of things, when she says men are irrational and they're led around by their dicks, and men get upset and say like, no, we're not. Well, I think taking that sarcastically, of course you're not, but men have been saying that about women for centuries. Millions of girls around the world right now as we are speaking are at risk for clitoridectomy or female genital mutilation because of these ideas. Yeah. Women who suggest drastic measures to combat drastic abuse are called man-haters, misandrists, my least favorite feminazis, and a host of lesbophobic slurs. And on the flip side, you have some women attempting to defang feminism in order to appease men, replacing calls for liberation with equality and watering down radical demands with liberal reformism. And the lumping in of liberal, quote, choice feminism with more revolutionary movements, bothers liberal feminists and revolutionaries alike. Carmen Vasquez notes in Towards a Revolutionary Ethics, quote, We can't even agree on what a feminist is, never mind what she would believe in, and how she defines the principles that constitute honor among us. In key with the American capitalist obsession for individualism, 
and anything goes so long as it gets you what you want. Feminism in America has come to mean anything you like, honey. There are as many definitions of feminism as there are feminists, some of my sisters say, with a chuckle. I don't think it's funny. End quote. I have some feminist criticisms of Solanus' scum manifesto outside the usual ones. I think, for instance, it's a bit gender reductionist in the sense that it implies the problem of men is the root of all other forms of oppression. And while I consider racism, classism, ableism, homophobia, and colonialism tightly intertwined with sexism and patriarchy, I don't think Solanus does a very good job of analyzing that. And especially given the current protests against state violence, which are being led by Black people, I find Valerie's little eliminate men and racism will vanish pitch to be almost patronizing. It reads as though Black women and women of color are an afterthought, which in many white feminist circles they are. So I guess my mini theses here are such. First, the Scum Manifesto as a boundary-pushing satirical text is good. Second, shooting Andy Warhol was bad. And third, feminism is much more complicated than kill all men or lick their boots. I wanted to point out as an aside, I know you said feminazi was the word like one you dislike the most, but do you notice it's no longer being used so often by men's rights activist types because now they've basically decided being a Nazi is actually a good thing? Ew, maybe. I can't say I have noticed, but the reason it's my least, I shouldn't say least favorite, the reason it's my most hated is because... I have ancestors who were murdered in Auschwitz by the Nazis, and like to compare feminists in any way to that is just so disgusting. Even flippantly, it's just such a wrong thing to do. When you put out a word like Nazi, some people deserve to be called Nazis, like Nazis or fascists or people who espouse Nazi ideology. But using Nazi as a blanket term for someone that you consider extremist in their viewpoints, perhaps, it's not cool. It's not okay. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. I just I just noticed that it's not been used anymore. And I think it's part of a larger sort of shift where the sort of like men's rights activists, the gamer gators, all these like niche single issue right wing people just sort of been funneled into a broader Nazi coalition, like an actual like fascist movement. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think if I mention feminism and a man's response is to say like, oh, you mean man-hating? It's like, okay, well, it's not worth my time to have this conversation, is it? In some ways, I think we're really, really far behind in terms of even discussing women's liberation. Yeah. Let's circle back to the attempted assassination of Andy Warhol. The year is presently 1967. Valerie Solanas has completed her play, Up Your Ass, And to disseminate her writing, and to earn a living, she decides it's about time to find a producer. So Solanus decides that Andy Warhol, with his eccentricity and proven track record of rebellious art, might work with her on bringing the play to life. She found him outside the factory and asked him to read her script, and he promised that he would. He also noticed that the manuscript was well-typed, which could be read as a sexist quip towards Solanus, I suppose, but... I've been complimented on the presentation of my work before, and I haven't taken it that way, but who knows. Also, we should note here that this was the 1960s and technology didn't allow for Solanus to save a digital copy of her play. Typing on a typewriter was time consuming, and each copy made could be expensive to print, especially for someone in precarious work like Valerie. It's also very possible that the copy of Up Your Ass she gave to Warhol was her only copy. Legend has it that Andy Warhol found Up Your Ass so vulgar that he was convinced that the whole thing was a plot to entrap him for producing obscene content. His exact thoughts or whether he actually read the script are pretty much unknown. Some writers have suggested that Warhol behaved very dismissively towards Solanus as well. At some point, however, Andy Warhol misplaces Solanus' script. When Solanus reached out to Warhol again about the play, he told her that he'd lost it. This really upset Valerie, and at some point, she began to believe that Warhol had either A, thrown the script away to fuck with her, or B, held on to the script to produce it on his own, without her. 
And in the meantime, Warhol paid Solanus $25 to appear in his film, I, a Man, as compensation for the lost script. Roger Ebert described the piece as a, quote, an elaborate, deliberately boring joke, end quote. Solanus also finished the Scum Manifesto and decided to seek out a publisher. Maurice Gerodius's Olympia Press, which had gained a reputation for publishing incendiary pieces that no other publishers would touch, including Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, seemed like a good candidate. So Solanus approached Gerodius, and he found the Scum Manifesto compelling, enough so that he paid Solanus a $500 advance for her next work. Solanus signed a contract for this, but later interpreted the deal as Gerodias attempting to own her work. This, combined with Andy Warhol losing the Up Your Ass script, pushed Valerie Solanus to believe that the two men were conspiring to steal her work. She became increasingly convinced that these events were connected, and she would later tell officials that she shot Andy Warhol because he had too much control in her life. In 1968, Valerie Solanus bought two firearms and decided to somehow assert her own control over the situation. Art dealer and agent Margot Feeden alleges that on June 3rd, hours before the shooting, Valerie Solanus came to visit her to once again pitch her script. Feeden told Solanus that she wouldn't publish her work and Solanus had a meltdown. She allegedly flashed her gun at Feeden and told her that she planned on shooting Andy Warhol. Feeden says that after Solanus left, she repeatedly rang the police, but to no avail. Maurice Gorodias claimed that at one point, Solanus had been at the Chelsea Hotel in Manhattan on the day of the shooting looking for him, but this has been disputed. It is true that Solanus had Gerodias on her enemy list, so perhaps this is why he thought she was looking for him. Or maybe he figured that it would make publishing the Scum Manifesto a better story. By afternoon, Solanus had made her way to the factory, where she rode up and down the elevator waiting for her nemesis, Andy Warhol. At approximately a quarter after four, he and his boyfriend arrived. Solanus took the elevator up with them. It wasn't long before she began shooting. Luckily for those at the factory that day, she didn't have a particularly good aim. Only one of three shots directed at Warhol hit him, but the damage was extensive. Surgeons had to open up his chest and restart his heart and he had to wear a surgical corset for the remainder of his life to hold himself together. Apparently, the ambulance drivers charged Andy Warhol $15 to turn on the sirens on the way to the hospital. Can we pause here for a second? I know in the sure. last last episode, we criticized the, health, the healthcare system in the US, but this is some peak Ayn Rand libertarian hellscape situation. Like imagine being in an ambulance due to a gunshot wound, bleeding your, your life out, And having to pay for like various tiers of urgency, like $5 and we'll run through traffic lights, $10 and you only get the flashing lights, $20 for the whole light and sound ensemble. It kind of reminds me of this video game called Bioshock, where it's like, it takes libertarianism to its logical conclusion, which is like a dystopia where everyone dies. But it's funny because libertarians would see something like this and justify it as like true freedom from like government oppression. Part of me doesn't believe this because how, when he's bleeding out from a gunshot wound, would he ever be able to like take out his wallet and hopefully have $15 in cash? But another part of me, I went to the hospital in an ambulance one time in my entire life. And the first thing they asked me when I got there was, do you have health insurance? My God, American healthcare system is just genuinely like shocking. Yeah, so maybe... That's just part of Andy Warhol's legend. Maybe it's true. I don't think we'll ever totally know. The near-death experience deeply affected Warhol, and he carried physical and emotional scars from the incident. Many critics organized his art into two distinct periods, pre-shooting and post-shooting. Andy Warhol would pass away 19 years later, in 1987, at the age of 58. He was recovering from gallbladder surgery it's very possible that the gunshot wounds partially contributed to his death. As for Solanus, she fled the scene after the shooting. As she attempted to shoot Fred Hughes in the chest and the gun jammed, the elevator door opened. Hughes pleaded with her, Valerie, there's the elevator, just take it. And she did. 
Later that day, Solanus approached a beat cop and turned herself in for what she believed was a murder, as she wasn't yet aware that Warhol had survived. She ended up being charged with felonious assault and possession of a deadly weapon, and later indicted for attempted murder, assault, and illegal possession of a gun. The story was sensational. The next day, the New York Daily News tabloid ran a feature on it with the headline, Actress Shoots Andy Warhol. Solanus was furious with the headline and demanded a retraction, not because it said she shot Andy Warhol, but because it called her an actress. I'm a writer, not an actress, she said. And I believe this only because I read the Scum Manifesto and I can absolutely see Valerie being a very rigid pedant. Oh, no, absolutely. I definitely see her being like, how could they call me an actress? Solanus also insisted that reports claiming she shot Andy Warhol because he wouldn't produce Up Your Ass were incorrect. Rather, she shot him because she believed he had, quote, a legal claim on her works, end quote, and was holding on to the play to produce it himself. This is likely what Solanus meant when she said Warhol had too much control in her life. Demanding to represent herself, Solanus told the judge, It's not often that I shoot somebody. I didn't do it for nothing. Warhol had me tied up, lock, stock, and barrel. He was going to do something to me which would have ruined me. When asked if she felt sorry about the shooting, Solanus reportedly replied, I consider it immoral that I missed. I should have done target practice. I'm sorry, but she is objectively hilarious. I actually feel so bad for Andy Warhol, because in addition to getting shot, he had to deal with the fact that the woman who attempted to murder him is making a satirical comedy show out of it. And a damn good one, too. Yeah, I'm not sure how much he talked about this later in his life, but, like, emotionally speaking, that just, it must be a lot to deal with. Oh, yeah. Valerie Solanus was remanded to Bellevue and would be diagnosed with chronic paranoid schizophrenia. When she was finally fit to stand trial, she pleaded guilty to reckless assault with intent to harm and was sentenced to three years in prison, one of which had already been served as she was shuffled between psychiatric wards. Keep in mind that this is the era where psychiatrists genuinely believe that women suffered from hysteria, uh, a disorder where their wombs would sort of just pack up and wander around the body, causing various psychological symptoms. Also the era where homosexuality was seen as a mental illness. That is not to say that Valerie was not schizophrenic, and it is suggested she definitely was, but I also don't think that at that time being remanded to a mental health facility uh, was any better than a normal prison, and probably worse in terms of treatments and the conditions of the stay. Right. While some might say that the sentence was light considering the gravity of the crime, I do want to point out that psychiatric hospitals, especially for women, were not places that you wanted to be in 1968. Think girl interrupted or one flew over the cuckoo's nest. According to Brian Foz, Valerie Solanus later told a support group that doctors at Bellevue had performed an experimental full hysterectomy on her, removing her reproductive organs. Foss writes, quote, Bellevue had a documented history of doing such procedures. Doctors at Bellevue experimented on women in order to develop more sophisticated techniques for gynecological surgery and often performed these procedures against the patient's will, end quote. That is just absolutely horrifying. Like, no matter your opinion on Valerie Solanus and what she did, I think that we can all say that is just inhumane and despicable. Nobody deserves that. Yeah, it's definitely not what I would consider justice at all. In 1971, Valerie Solanus was released from New York State Prison for Women and continued to stalk Andy Warhol and his associates via telephone until she was rearrested in November of that year and once again bumped around between mental institutions. After this, Valerie Solanus pretty much faded into obscurity. She moved around the country, struggling to get by. In 1988, at 52 years old, she died of pneumonia all alone at a hotel in San Francisco. Her mother, Dorothy, still alive, burned all of Valerie's remaining belongings. Oh, that's just so sad. Valerie Solanus had a really sad start and a sad end to life. The legacy of her writing is complicated by her actions. 
It's difficult to say that the Scum Manifesto is a clever work of satire when its authors seem to take the message very literally. But as we said before, I don't think Valerie Solanus's anti-man politics were at the center of the assassination attempt. Rather, I think this was a combination of Valerie's mental illness and lifelong trauma projected onto her interactions with Andy Warhol. This doesn't justify violence, but it does help to explain it in the bigger picture. Andy Warhol is 100% a victim here, but Valerie Solanus is a victim too. In some ways, it also reminds me of Mark David Chapman's assassination of John Lennon in 1980. There are the elements of paranoia and fixation on synchronicities. And Chapman wanted some of John Lennon's fame, just as Solanus wanted some of Warhol's connections and acclaim, and felt that these were being stolen from her. The Scum Manifesto is available for free online if you're interested in reading it. It has been a very influential text to some feminists and queer currents. Foz pens, quote, There is something about the Scum Manifesto. Its brashness, its vivid, its startling anger, its outrageous humor and wit, its uncanny insights and truth, end quote. And if someone wants to argue that the Scum Manifesto should be put into the context of Solanus's attempted murder of Andy Warhol, then fair enough. But shouldn't it also be put into the context of the abuse she endured from men as a child, the sexism she encountered at university, and the horror she faced as a woman in a psychiatric facility? When I first read The Scum Manifesto, I found it loudmouthed and farcical, sure, but I also identified with Valerie's anger at the patriarchy. I, too, have faced sexist discrimination, and while I obviously don't want to destroy the male sex by literally offing men one by one, I do want to upend the systems which facilitate sexist oppression, and I know that some men will feel afraid, disempowered, and emasculated by that. In 2018, the Huelga Feminista, or Feminist Strike in Spain, called for a society free of sexist oppression, exploitation, and violence for rebellion and a struggle against the alliance of patriarchy and capitalism that wants us to be obedient, submissive, and quiet. If there's one point to take away from the Scum Manifesto and its influence on feminist theory, in my opinion, it's that we aren't going to get anywhere by sitting down and shutting up. I'm not saying we should shoot people, God no, but we shouldn't paint a happy face on our own oppression to make it more palatable to the dominant class. It's like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, quote, Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed, end quote. I'm not going to let someone walk all over me because I'm afraid that demanding better treatment will hurt their feelings. And this is something that I'm personally guilty of and something I think feminists broadly need to address. Of course, some men feel intimidated by feminism because it confronts their power, just as some white people oppose anti-racist movements and bosses make every effort to restrict unions. So what? I'm not going to grovel at their feet so that they might like me. Fuck them. I agree with a lot of what you said. I genuinely think that the Scum Manifesto raises a lot of very poignant conclusions and insights. And I think part of how incisive it is, is its language. I don't think it would have been anywhere near as effective if it was more toned down or or sort of uh, reduced in in its sharpness. I also think it's really interesting because she does make a lot of very good points about how men, basically older men socialize boys to become men in a sort of cycle and inculcate in them all these sort of toxic attributes of being a man, like suppressing your emotions, like being prone to anger, um, stuff like that. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also the other side of it, like, like like you said, I think it's reductive in it basically boils down all of the world's problems to like patriarchy and the gender sort of power imbalance. And I think it was really misplaced, if you will. I think Valerie sort of, she began, understandable given her childhood, but she began with a sort of, I hate men and worked her way backwards with these sort of theories and insights. And some of these theories are right, and some of these insights are right. But there's one point in the manifesto that I found really interesting. One of the things she does is she attributes to masculinity isolations, suburbs, and prevention of community, 
Quote, Our society is not a community, but merely a collection of isolated family units. Desperately insecure, fearing his woman will leave him if she is exposed to other men or to anything remotely resembling life, the male seeks to isolate her from other men and from what little civilization there is. So he moves her out to the suburbs, a collection of self-absorbed couples and their kids. Isolation enables him to try to maintain his pretense of being an individual, new becoming a rugged individualist, a loner, equating non-cooperation and solitariness with individuality, end quote. And that is really interesting because, yes, suburbs are a symptom of a deeper malaise, but it's not masculinity and it's not patriarchy. It is alienation under late state capitalism and sort of the atomization into smaller and smaller and smaller units that people have experienced in the last like 200 years as we just sort of become cogs in a machine. But she doesn't point that. She thinks it's just men who want to hide their women, which is completely misdirected in my opinion. Yeah, we can trace straight back to Engels, for instance. And I'm sure to many, frankly, uncredited women before him, the connections between capitalism and sexism within the nuclear family. But I I think there are things that Valerie hits right on the nose, frankly. But there's probably more points where she comes close and then she just misses it. Like I said before, with her analysis of race, she basically has one paragraph where she's like, And if we get rid of the men, there's not going to be racism. Really, Valerie, really. Yeah, it's very, it's very uh, reductive and very, it's like she thinks that like ending manhood or men is just the be all end all. And it's really, really, it's very close. Like you said, it's so close and it's frustrating because it's so close, but then it just swerves completely aside. I think too, when she says eliminate all men, Obviously, that's going to get people worked up, and that's exactly what she wants. But when we say eliminate the patriarchy, what we mean is eliminate a system which, in many ways, privileges men over women, which oppresses women, and that in order to liberate women, we are going to have to completely change the system in which we live. And I feel the same about anti-racist movements happening right now. And I say eliminate white supremacy, you know? We don't have to, like, kill off every white person on the planet, although, you know, if I gotta go, I gotta go. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, we do have to face a structure that privileges people with my skin color over people of your skin color, Amr. And I understand if I called the police, it would be a lot less dangerous for me than it would for you or, God forbid, for a black man And if we overturn that system, there will be privileges relative to other people that I lose in sense of like a zero sum game. However, I think it is the morally right thing to do to look that in the eye and address it. Yeah, and it's the same for me with regards to like, I know that this current system benefits me in terms of my gender over you. And in a zero sum game, confronting that system will mean that I will lose a lot of privileges. But it is also the morally correct thing to do to achieve a sort of better future for everyone, achieve true justice. Hopefully me saying that you can be my recommendation into the men's auxiliary units. Like I can can write you in my application to the men's auxiliary units. Yeah. So when we kill all the men, Amr, we'll save you for last. How's that? Not for last, but like you can like reduce me to like menial labor, like in a labor camp somewhere. Maybe we could have like a, a beehive system with like <laughs> drones. But drones die, like they, they get kicked out after they fulfill their task, which is sad. I do find the Scum Manifesto and other similar inflammatory texts and pieces, I suppose you could say, they're just hilarious in the fact that men react exactly how you expect them to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They get so so upset and they're like not all men i know that as a woman raised in the united states it hasn't been as bad for me as it could have been if i was born somewhere else in the world you know into a different class into a different skin color all these other factors that being said i've still had to face a lifetime of men when you talk about sexism then just downplaying it and gaslighting you and saying like oh my god you're being so sensitive like 
men cannot handle the slightest criticism. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's par on course for living in a system and a society where they never had to face any criticism, which is one of uh, Valerie's more interesting points in terms of like being coddled from birth uh, and therefore becoming this very fragile, very vulnerable. I don't want to say weakness, but sort of like inability to accept any form of criticism because they've been coddled all their lives. And how we kind of mentioned before, daddy issues and that's something that people will say about a girl with issues with her father like abandonment issues or abuse or what have you which is like a shitty thing to say totally but how can we never talk about boys and their mommy issues mommy issues have created the ted bundys of the world why don't we talk about that but it's also interesting that daddy issues usually refer to girls who have been like emotionally disconnected from their dads, like their dads are like not available emotionally or abusive in some way or shape. Whereas mommy issues are the exact opposite, where a mother is like basically over mothering a boy, a son. Right. And then he looks for in women partners a new mommy who's going to like yes. do his laundry and cook for him and probably wipe his ass. Yes, and like, you know, as Valerie says, suckle on her teats. She says She's that. so it's funny. Like She's great. so funny. She's so great. <laughs> Guys, you got to read the Scum Manifesto. Don't take our word for any of this stuff. Read it yourself. Decide what you think. You know our opinions, but if you just read it, you got to read it. <laughs> it's like small brain is like communist manifesto. Galaxy brain is scum manifesto. I actually now, I love how angry it is. Like, once in a while, you just need a good screed. Yeah. So we presented this episode as a possible one that we might do to our Patreon subscribers. And that was 10 days ago from the time of recording. So we didn't know what was going to begin happening in the United States and Canada with the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis PD. And now I feel like that anger it's actually sometimes very important to put that out into the world. Instead of holding on to it ourselves, we have to actually confront the wrongs that are being done onto us. And when I say us in this sense, I mean women. I'm not Black, but there's still a connection there of how Valerie really did push the boundaries in terms of not just rolling over to the oppressor. Yeah. And I mean, she grew up in a period that was very difficult for women of her class, of her background. Everything from her childhood onwards was hell, basically. Right. And I I think parts of the Scum Manifesto do read very white. Like, I, I think there's a lack of analysis of things like misogynoir, which is discrimination specifically faced by Black women. And this was also a time when the civil rights protests were going on. 1968, when she shot Andy Warhol, is the year that MLK Jr. was assassinated, and that cannot be overlooked. But I think in terms of the feminist movement as well, it was an era where people were taking strides forward, and when they got pushed back, were basically saying, like, too bad, I don't care. Yeah. Speaking of rising up and demanding an end to oppression, we, of course, want to mention our comrades fighting for racial justice in places like Minneapolis at this very moment. And we're going to include a link in the show notes for people wondering how you can help. It's blacklivesmatter.card.co, and card is spelled with two R's, so C-A-R-R-D dot C-O. Again, we'll put a link to that. If you like our show, we'd normally ask you to subscribe, rate, and maybe check out our Patreon, which, of course, we would love it if you do. But please, guys, this week, especially this month, you know, if you've only got a limited amount of money, please put it toward those bail funds, activists, those people, you know, before donating to us. Yeah, we're humble podcasters. The activists need a lot more. For all of our free listeners, I'll see you next week. For our Patreon listeners, see you on Wednesday. Yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. For our Patreon subscribers, Wednesday, we're going to talk about bees and Osama bin Laden. Osama B and Laden, so to speak. Oh my God. Amr won't say that. Don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) But thank you guys for listening. Please stay safe out there.